Kovacevich and I'm currently the coordinator of communication studies. This event is in cooperation with Stockton University's communication studies program, the School of Arts and Humanities, the History Club, the Historical Studies Program, and the Sarah and Sam Schofer Holocaust Resource Center. Here at Stockton, we jointly work together with students, faculty, and community across the disciplines, and this film is clearly an example of this. We welcome Stockton students, faculty, staff, local educators, and extended community members. We have a link for Osprey Advantage for Stockton students and PDH certificates for New Jersey educators. Students should click on the link in the chat to get the Osprey Advantage and New Jersey educators should email Morgan Everman. Her email is also listed in the chat. Joining us today are Toby Rosenthal, Communication Studies Teaching Specialist and Filmmaker, Holocaust survivor Leo Ullman, internationally renowned historian, author, and Academy Award-winning historical film consultant, Dr. Michael Birnbaum, Director of Stockton Holocaust Resource Center, Gail Rosenthal, and Program Assistants in the Center, Morgan Everman and Irvin Moreno Rodriguez. Unfortunately, Stockton's Associate Professor of History, Dr. Michael Hayes, cannot be with us today as he is recovering from a medical procedure and we wish him well. Together, we will view the Telly award-winning 25-minute film, There Were Good People, Doing Extraordinary Deeds, Leo Ullman's Story. When the film concludes, Toby Rosenthal, the producer of the film, will moderate a panel discussion on the story behind the story and take us through the process of creating the documentary. We are honored to have Holocaust survivor Leo Ullman with us. Questions can be sent in the chat box directly to Morgan Everman throughout the screening and panel discussion. We will begin the film now. Thank you. My name is Leopold Solomon Ullmann. I was born on July 14th, 1939, Bastille Day, in Amsterdam, Holland. I was born to parents who were leading a wonderful life. My mother's family had long been uh, in Amsterdam. Her father had a very successful diamond cutting business. My father's family came from Germany, and he came to Holland in 1932 when he graduated high school and uh, met my mother through a cousin when he and that cousin were both employed by the Bayenkorf, the largest Dutch department store in Amsterdam. Immediately after um, I was born, we moved to uh, an apartment in Amsterdam South where uh, the better to do Jewish families lived. It was a very nice apartment. Once the war started and the Germans took over Holland, one of their first decrees 
was that all Jewish people had to come to Amsterdam. And so as a result of that, in that apartment, we suddenly had grandparents, an uncle, an aunt, and a grand, great grandmother. Um, and somehow they got along and life went on. We lived in that apartment until um, the decision was made that we had to go into hiding to become illegal, to live like rats, as my mother called it. They were absolutely certain that if they were caught uh, and deported, it would be certain death. Going into hiding was influenced by two specific events. One is that the Germans or the Dutch acting on behalf of the Germans warned them that they had to be ready to be deported within X days. In the meantime, my mother's sister, whose husband was extremely active in the resistance, and her children were ultimately picked up. And even though they were first put in a jail, and my grandmother on my mother's side was able to keep them from being deported for a while. Ultimately, they were deported, notwithstanding their efforts. I wouldn't say it was an easy decision because it's a very, very, very difficult decision. I appreciate that my parents had lived a very, very good life and they had zillions of friends and uh, they had the means to do most anything they wanted, and all of a sudden, uh, they had to disappear. I would act up and make noise and yell and scream and cry, whatever, so they could not even consider taking me into hiding. And that was a very difficult decision, a decision that uh, my grandparents, my paternal grandparents, really resented at the time. They thought it was a horrible thing to get rid of their child. Um, but my parents made the decision that was the only way to survive. They had to figure out how to go into hiding and what to do with me. And for that, they had an awful lot of help. A lot of my mother's friends were very active in the resistance, in the Dutch resistance. It was a passive type of resistance where, you know, they, they uh, destroyed records in, in the civil registry. And if they were caught and the Germans were after these people, um, they would be summarily executed or shipped to ultimately to a death camp. The decision was made to hand me over to a resistance group that placed Jewish kids. It was important to wean me away slowly. I was sent for days at a time to the homes of my mother's sorority sisters. And so I would feel comfortable not being with them for stretches of time. It was almost given that when you went into hiding, the parents would not know where you were or even with whom you were being located. Uh, because that was part of the risk, that people would talk inadvertently or somehow uh, risk uh, disclosing the hiding place. I was placed initially with a young man uh, who lived outside Amsterdam uh, and who was newly married. His name was Anton Schimmel. It didn't work out very well because he and his wife uh, were having marital difficulties and I'm sure I exacerbated those uh, severely, and they decided that they couldn't keep me. And I was then placed uh, for a short period, an interim period, with a sort of uh, orphanage. And at that point, Anton Schimmel's father and mother decided that they liked me, and they got me out of that orphanage, and they took me in. They only knew that I was a Jewish child. They were in their 50s. They had two adult children, and then they had an adopted daughter named uh, Tilly. There were these people who were, I'd say, ordinary people, though they weren't ordinary, who uh, made extraordinary gestures to save other people um, whom they didn't know without 
any thought of any uh, benefit from doing that except uh, thinking it was the right thing to do. In September of uh, 2017, we uh, went to visit some of the places that were meaningful uh, in my early life. We went and visited um, my hiding place during the war, which was an apartment. I was placed eventually with the people in this apartment whose names are Hendrik and Janneke Schimmel Mansholt. This is the first time that I've been back. There we were lucky to find a student who lived in the apartment and he graciously let us in. Won't you hear a lung? Uh, no, okay. It was a very generous gesture on his part to let us film and it was wonderful for me to see where I was hidden for the first time, in fact, since the war. At the Risico, I think that this is, may have been my room, and I shared a room with my war sister, Tilly. Tilly was 13 years older than I was. For the first few weeks, perhaps, they let me out. They dyed my hair blonde, and they let me play outside. But after a couple of weeks, they decided no longer to do that. So I basically stayed in the apartment for the entire war. During the night, we had to blacken the windows by pulling down dark shades so that the Allies and perhaps the Germans as well could not see where they were and that the city was uh, a subject to being bombarded. Uh, it feels very special. Piece of history. I also was taken from this home periodically when the Schimmels learned that there would be a raid by the Germans looking for Jewish hidden persons. And then they would ship me off to their son who lived outside the city in a far suburb. Opa, who was a retired policeman, had an interest in a bar which was in or near the red light district. And in that bar, there was a barmaid named Paula. And that was my, she became my Aunt Paula and she visited frequently, and this was Opa's girlfriend. But she helped save me, as a matter of fact, because by virtue of her being in a bar visited by German soldiers, German policemen, uh, she was able to find out when there would be a raid, for example. And also, because she was in the bar, she was able to get access to food, and she would get access to some money, because the only people who had money during the war were the German soldiers and officers and so forth. My parents were ultimately in a hiding place on a main street of Amsterdam called the Centurban, which is the, it's a belt. Centur is a belt street. That's the attic where my parents lived in one large room. And after October of 43, a cousin of my mother came to stay with them. They had no idea where I was hidden or with whom. And correspondingly, the people that I was hidden with had no idea who they were hiding or where I was from. What is most hard to imagine about people being in hiding, and certainly in the situation where my parents were on a main street of Amsterdam, where there were raids periodically to find hidden Jewish people, and where people were paid huge bounties to uh, betray Jewish people. Under those circumstances, to be in an attic uh, without light, without heat, um, 
day in, day out with each other, every minute of every day, and every footstep, every motorized vehicle, every uh, noise outside could mean the end of your life. Um, I think that type of terror is something that you can't reproduce in a play. Uh, you could see a hundred Anne Frank uh, um, plays. Uh, you can't, I don't think, replicate that kind of utter and complete terror. I do have memories of the end of the war because that was just incredible. I was let out. And the most significant part of all of that is that when we came outside, everybody knew that I was a hidden child and no one on the block had betrayed us. In the meantime, the woman intermediary with the resistance told my parents where I was in hiding and my parents left the apartment and came to find me. One of the first things uh, my parents arranged with Oman Opus Himmel is that they wouldn't take me away immediately completely. So that it took a period of days going back and forth to their hiding place and then staying with Oman and Opa at night. My war parents gave to me their dog, Rufi. And that was very meaningful to us. It was a gesture that just indicated how much they valued being in our lives and vice versa. We ultimately went to uh, the Veloska Strat 5, uh, where we lived uh, after the war. Uh, my parents were able to acquire the house that my mother's sister owned. Um, which was occupied by German uh, um, officials during the war. This was again my first time in going back and this was a bit more emotional for me because I at least remembered it. That um, was very lucky because the owner of the house graciously let us in and it hadn't changed a bit since the late 40s. So uh, that was a very nice experience. The keuken bijvoorbeeld met het graniet. It's just a This is the school that I attended from 1945 to 1947. We go into the courtyard where I'd never been back. There were a couple of women there to pick up their children. And um, Somehow we got to talking while we were there. There was this woman who, who was just blown away by our story because it matched her story. And they had seven children and they hid a little child, Jewish child, so all the family could be dead. Her grandfather had been honored at Yad Vashem. Uh, for saving a, a Jewish child. Whatever the consequences, you just did it. They're very brave and I'm very proud. I have this Yad Vashem painting now just to tell my children what would you do in a situation like this. It was just a, a totally unexpected, fortuitous, serendipitous moment that, uh, that was just a highlight of that day. Oh, that's beautiful. The thing that was so meaningful is that here we shared a story uh, that had a message and the message for all those people around including the other woman that was with her there was that there were good people doing extraordinary deeds to save other people uh, that kind of humanity is something that's pretty rare and rarely seen these days and that was remarked upon our family left Amsterdam in December 1947 um, to come to the U.S. We traveled with my younger brother who was born in 1946. We landed uh, after an eight-day trip on the Westerdam, a converted Liberty boat of the Holland America Line 
in Hoboken, New Jersey. And we moved to a house in Port Washington, New York. It's a story of survival. We survived and if you survive uh, and you have the strength to survive, you can achieve anything that you want to do. Over a period of several years, um, I worked to uh, document the role of the Schimmels and of uh, a policeman named Pete Hochebohm uh, in saving me and also in saving much of my parents' family. Pete Hochebohm saved dozens of people, even though my mother and father found their own hiding place. He arranged fake IDs, the food coupons, um, and he arranged to provide correspondence and contacts with other members of the family who were also in hiding. We managed to uh, uh, create their story, have it certified and audited and reviewed by the authorities at Yad Vashem in Israel, and we arranged to have them honored as the righteous among the nations, their name inscribed on a wall at Yad Vashem. And the honors were given formally with the medals and the certificates um, in Holland in, on September 19th um, at the Jewish Historical Museum for a ceremony that was arranged by the Israeli Embassy and there were members present of the Israeli Embassy, the U.S. Cultural Attaché, the people from uh, the Jewish Historical Museum, the head of the Anne Frank Center, people from Stockton University. This is my grandfather, Peter Hogenbaum Sr. Are they heroes? Are they not heroes? I don't know. For me, they are heroes, but I think when you ask them themselves, they would have said, no, we just did what was necessary. I think um, that my mother-in-law um, never, never realized how dangerous it was that they hid uh, Leo. She never mentioned it, you know, it was just sort of thing you don't think about that how dangerous it is for Leo, but also for, 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 for themselves. Today's ceremony for me was, uh, it was emotional. It was. It already was. I went to Yad Vashem a year ago as far as I saw their names engraved in this wall. And it's getting more con concrete. I knew the story all my life. But now if you hear all these people and, and see this medal, and, and, uh, and you, yeah, even more, I don't know how it's possible, even more, you realize how, how special it was. And they, 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 they brought their own lives in, in danger to, to hide a boy. And, it's, it's very special. It was a very thrilling and exciting and emotional moment. There were approximately 40 uh, relatives of the Hochebaum and Schimmel families who attended the event, and a very, very proud moment for them and for all of us. What was special for me during the course of this um, ceremony was how they captured the essence of the people who saved us. I thought we would make a mark at Stockton. What's significant is that New Jersey requires basically the study of the Holocaust. And therefore there was a lot of active interaction between the Resource Center and various high schools. Uh, and I had the opportunity, therefore, to meet students, which I enjoyed. I like telling the story, believe it or not. Um, and I like to, uh, to see young people who are engaged and then who can relate it to their respective stories, which are often uh, situations that are very difficult where they've come from other countries and often it's people who haven't been exposed to the Holocaust story at all and have never seen anybody who was a live survivor. The idea 
for the exhibit was, of course, to honor these people who saved our lives and saved the lives of so many people in my family. The Schimmels and the Hochebohms were what we would say ordinary people. They were regular people. They weren't special. They weren't designated to help people and, uh, and cause people to survive the war somehow. Rather, they were people who were convinced that they were doing the right thing by helping us, helping others like us. The people that we're honoring here, uh, they never wavered in their support. Joining us for the post film discussion are Toby Rosenthal, communication studies teaching specialist and filmmaker, Holocaust survivor Leo Ullman, historian Dr. Michael Bierenbaum, director of Stockton's Holocaust Resource Center, Gail Rosenthal, and program assistants in the center, Morgan Everman and Irvin Moreno Rodriguez. Toby. Throughout our time together, we are continuing to invite our audience, our students, our community to share feedback in the chat. Um, and we will make space throughout our time to address questions, comments. We want to hear from you who have joined us also. Um, Leo, as we begin our conversation about the process of creating this film and its relevance to our viewers, I'd like to ask you the first question. Um, and the first question to you is, what do you think is the most important theme coming from this film? I'm going to invite you also unmute. Yep. Perfect. Yep. It might have been better if I were unmuted at any point, at any rate. Um, I think the lesson from the film is really the title of the film, that these were people who just felt it was the right thing to do to take in a little kid whom they didn't know um, and to save his life somehow, because it was the right thing to do. In that instance, uh, the people who saved me were very religious, and um, they just felt it was absolutely the right thing to do, and as was mentioned in the film, they never wavered. And if there's a lesson there, that's the lesson that if you're confronted with this situation, would you um, have the ultimate goodness to take the steps that these people took. Thank you. Okay, so Morgan has sent me a few questions to start and this one um, sounds like something that we can talk to about right away. 
Leo, what was your most vivid memory of this time hiding with the Schimmels? Sadly enough, I don't have much in the way of memories um, because I was with people who uh, were no longer with me after the war. Uh, I had nobody to reinforce and ask me, do you remember this or do you remember that? Uh, there were no photos that I'm aware of. Um, so my most vivid memory was the day the war ended and we all went on the street and I was out for the first time and everybody wore something orange to honor the House of Orange, the governing um, royal family of the Netherlands. And um, it was just unbelievably exciting. And then all of a sudden, during those first couple of days, suddenly I was introduced to people who claimed to be my parents. And I had no idea who these people were. I did not remember them because I was too young when uh, they gave me up. OK, thank you. So now we're going to take a step back in time and talk about how this film came to be. Uh, Gail Rosenthal and Dr. Birnbaum, can you share with us a bit of the history of Stockton's relationship with Mr. Ullman? I will begin and then I'll let Dr. Birnbaum, uh, so in the very beginning of the story is that um, so much of life, and I tell this to my students all the time, are connections. Don't just throw away an opportunity to meet someone because you never know where a connection will lead you. So I knew um, a Holocaust survivor, his name was Jack Pollock. Maybe he's listening to us from heaven now. And um, I met him at a conference and we uh, continued a relationship. He was in Bergen-Belsen and he survived with his wife. And one day he called me and he said, I want to tell you something. A friend of mine has bought a business near where you teach, where you work. And so began my relationship with Mr. Ullman, who lives out on Long Island, but he bought a business in our area. And we began our relationship and I asked him how he knew my friend Jack Pollock and he said, we're very involved in an organization called the Anne Frank Center in New York. And that's how we began. And then I soon found out from him that he was also a Holocaust survivor, certainly a different story than Jack Pollock, who was also from the Netherlands, but a prisoner in Bergen-Belsen. And then Michael Birnbaum, I'll let you pick up on the story as you began your a teaching career here at Stockton University, then it was Stockton College as the IDE King Chair in Holocaust Studies visiting professor. Well, uh, Gail Rosenthal invited me to consult on this project. And the first thing we did was to go to meet with Leo at his home. And he had this incredible collection of documents relating to his experience, but also to the general experience of Jews in Amsterdam and Jews in Heidi. And he asked at that point, um, really, what should he do with those documents? And I said to him that he really should do two things with those documents. First, he should give the documents to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum because it's a research center where scholars work and where scholars peruse this document. But um, I didn't think that they were going to do an exhibition on uh, the documents and on, the, uh, on, on Leo's story, but it's really one of the wonderful things is that Leo didn't make it his story. He made it about the story of his rescuers. And then we had the incredible opportunity, thanks to um, the good fortune of working with Stockton, that we were able to create an interactive exhibition that takes up an entire room in Stockton, right outside the Gail Rosenthal room for the Holocaust Resource Center. And we, anybody who knows Gail's incredible work is honored that it's called the Gail Rosenthal, uh, the Gail Hirsch Rosenthal uh, room. And we created um, an exhibition 
and the film became, in one sense, the centerpiece of the exhibition. Along with, in the back, you see uh, an interactive screen. You see photographs of um, uh, that come out of uh, Leo's collection. You see a, a, a landscape of um, the buildings in Amsterdam. And we had this incredible opportunity to tell the entire story of uh, the people who rescued Leo and Leo himself. And it, um, the other wonderful thing about it is it really was only guided by us. It was really created by students. Professor Michael Hayes uh, drew in his students to do the historical research. The students in the communications um, uh, area of, of Stockton University began working on the interactivity, and everybody worked together in a very exciting way. Now these, for example, uh, and we had little things. These, for example, are um, canisters in which you see sugar, tea, and coffee. And Leo, why don't you tell us about these canisters because they also give a certain ethos uh, to what uh, we were able to create. Well, these uh, canisters were uh, in the room or the attic room where my parents were hidden. And um, they're on top of some um, stamps or um, um, welfare uh, stamps that we were able to use to get um, various items of food and so forth. And to get those, again, uh, my parents had to uh, arrange to get fake IDs, which the people who hid them were able to use to get some sugar, tea, and coffee. But here they were in that attic with just um, absolutely only uh, a little bit of light they could create with a candle and put mirrors around it to enhance the power of uh, the candle and otherwise they had no heat no electricity and they survived in that attic for two and a half years and they were in the same room together 24 hours a day um, for all that time and the trust that you have to develop in one another to spend that much time of your entire life together without even a minute of a break is just inconceivable to me. Well, you know, the, the remarkable thing I want to say is that um, it's going to be more conceivable to the visitors to Stockton when in the future uh, may it speedily come upon us when in the future the university reopens because we are um, spending our time uh, in reduced contact with the outside world. But if you notice as part of the story, uh, Leo at first could go out to play and then afterwards he could not go out to play. His parents could go out uh, for uh, a bit at the beginning, but then the only time his mother went out was what, when she had a toothache and the dentist had to risk his life and her life to fix that. So we're gonna have a greater appreciation of what it was like to live in hiding. Nothing quite analogous, but living in hiding without Zoom, without any of the internet, without any contact with the outside world. And um, uh, living with uh, one other person and uh, we're gonna be asking all sorts of questions as we probe deeper into the story. Thank you, that is great. Um, we are also getting lots of questions in and comments in the chat. I'm going to um, ask one more to um, Leo. After the war, did you meet other families with hidden children? And was there ever an attempt to collect their stories? Um, I did not personally appreciate, um, while in Holland, I was only six, seven years old, um, but 
right after the war, um, the daughter of my um, mother's, let me just think, my mother's uh, cousin, uh, who had been killed during the war, uh, came to live with us. And she was my age and um, stayed with us for those nine months. And now she is living in California and we have kept in touch and we have uh, worked together to help uh, an author who created a book or is creating a book on our entire family. Other than that, I have had really no specific contacts. Of course, while the head of Anne Frank Center for many years, I did have contacts with many others, but I, it's not pursuant to specific uh, pursuits that I, uh, that I created. We produced the film in uh, stages. And what the audience may not realize is that the sequence that you see the film appear for you is not exactly the sequence that we uh, shot in. Um, it was not necessarily chronological, right? And for the storytellers who we all consider ourselves storytellers in some capacity um, as well. So you all know that story structure can move about. And when shooting, this is also um, a similar thing. Uh, what we want to talk about today, though, is the chronology of how things happened um, in real time and compare that to how you saw how our audience saw that uh, play out in the story. So um, Gail, Leo, Dr. Birnbaum, can you please share with us how Yad Vashem and that contact quickly set off the chain of events that led to the production of this film? Well, I'll begin by saying those of you that know me know that I can sometimes be somewhat of a nudge, but don't agree to that in the chat box, please. But uh, all kidding aside, I nudged, pushed Leo a little bit when every time he came to Stockton and he wrote a magnificent, fantastic memoir uh, about his experiences. And I said, but it would be so great if we get these families recognized who risk their lives to save not only you, um, but uh, your parents, et cetera. And so he, uh, Leo did, to his credit, apply to uh, Yad Vashem, to a department called Righteous Among the Nations. And um, again, we get back to our connectors and networking. We helped with that and it happened. And once the ball got rolling, it happened rather quickly. And then we decided, wouldn't this be an important moment to document it? I didn't know why. We just knew to document it. We weren't sure that we were doing a film, but we wanted to take photographs. We wanted to um, take pictures uh, because of our strong connection with Leo Ullman as a child who was hidden. And um, it, the invitation came from uh, Amsterdam. And we decided to contact again connectors, our friends at the Anne Frank House, who said, would you like to have a high quality film done of it? We have someone that we use um, who produces television programs. And that's how it happened that we had the high quality film. But we weren't exactly sure what we were going to do with it. I don't know if there's anything, Leo, you want to add at that point prior to our journey to Amsterdam. No, I, I, I'd, I'd rather just hear some more questions, but specifically, uh, you should mention that the filmmakers made me walk up those steep stairs a dozen times till they got it right and uh, come down that street also a dozen times and look out the window at different angles another dozen times. So it wasn't all just quick, quick shots, but the serendipitous meeting with the women 
in the school that I attended, that was just amazing and so lucky and so special. Let's, let's tell, Gail, let me, uh, let's tell our audience, um, Yad Vashem has two very specific criteria uh, by which they honor people. The first is that they must have um, had their lives at risk in order to save a Jew, and they must have done so without any recompense or without the expectation of recompense, and that is done for its own sake. But I want you to see something that was done in this film, um, which really has an impact on all of us. Yad Vashem labels these people uh, righteous among the nations of the earth. We, in working on this film, and we in the exhibition, are a lot more modest. We call them good people, really ordinary people who did extraordinary things. And we do so for a very specific reason, because all of us are in one sense ordinary people, and all of us can have the opportunity if we stretch ourselves, if we have the right moral values, if we have the right approach, all of us can have the opportunity in ways large and small to do extraordinary things. And you don't have to be up here to do extraordinary things. You can be ordinary human beings like you and like me. Let me say one other thing. There are small details that show in this film, and I don't want, want us to miss it, that show the extraordinariness of what happened. Leo narrates that um, immediately uh, when he was gonna go into hiding, his mother's sorority friends took him for a day and as it were, eased his separation from his mother so it became a little bit less dramatic. And, um, they also did something else, which is brilliant. And these were not great psychologists or psychiatrists or children educators or, or, or even teachers. They did something else that I want you to notice, which is that they didn't grab Leo all at once and take him back. They, what, they did the nice thing, which is to let him spend some time with his parents, bring him back, not abandon him, and then they gave him this dog, which becomes all important because it's an ongoing symbol that a child can identify of their presence in his life. So it's the little things that create a magnificent symphony of rescue. Agreed. Thank you. And that's probably the reason why Leo is as well adjusted. You know, we can go, those of you taking children's psychology, this is a man who could have suffered from separation anxiety, not once, but twice, could have perceived himself as endangered. But it's the little gestures of humanity and kindness that, you know, come together to form something absolutely extraordinary. The last thing I want to add when you asked about putting it together, I don't know if it was luck, a higher power, or whatever it may be. Every place we went that Leo had a uh, connection with that we wanted to film was available to us. I mean, can you imagine we knocked on the door you saw where he went up that flight of stairs? Well, there was a student that lived there and he said, absolutely not. You cannot come into my apartment. It's finals, I'm a medical student, and you may not come in. And furthermore, the place is a mess. And the photographer explained to him what it was about, please, we don't care what the apartment looks like. And he reluctantly said, yes, that was amazing. And of course, uh, you know, what he considered a mess wasn't messy at all. Uh, and he gave us a good 45 minutes to an hour he took out of his studying to let us come in. And that's how that day went, that we got into places we never expected to, including it was an accident that we parked the car 
next to the playground and just nonchalantly, Leo said to us, that's where I went to school. And I said, well, let's go see it. You haven't seen it, you know, since you were in the, you know, elementary school. And we walked on the playground and we whispered to each other, can you imagine if this was in the States, they'd be calling the security guards. And then the parents were, of course, were speaking Dutch and wanted to know what it was we were about. The camera person had put away his equipment and his microphone. And then this woman, he explained to them why we were there, our camera person. And this woman came forward and started to tell the story. And I went, I gave him a nudge that, take your camera out. He said, okay, but I don't have the right microphone. We won't be able to hear it. And look how clear it was. And what she said, we were all stunned. Thank you all for that. So there are questions related to the uh, layering of how the film came to be. Um, how do you go about getting footage from the war? So I can share some of that process. And as you're hearing the timeline, what happened first was that connection with Yad Vashem. Then the trip was quickly planned to uh, go take this journey with Leo Ullman and his family. And then after that, we then had multiple shoot days in where we sat down with Leo to uh, do the one-on-one -on -one testimonial style interview, right? That was the beautifully lit um, shot where Leo was in his home. Um, and then we began to layer in the things like the archival footage from the war. So that process was very uh, detailed and took a great deal of time. So some of the sources you saw in the credits um, for that and uh, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum was a great archive. Yad Vashem as well has archive footage that we used. Um, on a different trip, Irvin uh, Moreno Rodriguez went with Dr. Hayes back to Amsterdam to uh, gather other archival footage, which we were then able to call through hours of in a different language, figure out what was what. I, this was a very time consuming process to uh, get that layering into, but that was done way later. But as you could see, the spacing for it was really necessary to set the, the tone, the mood, the time, the place, the space. So um, that was one way that we all had to really cooperate and work together to find out also, is this authentic? Is this something that we can use? How do we get clearance for this? And for the students and for the film producers on this, um, you understand that process a little bit about how that works. Also with the music and those clearances, um, figuring out the right mood and tone with that, that was part of that layering in process as well. So I hope that that answers some of those questions about how um, the archive footage was selected. Um, and that leads me to, into the next question, oh, actually. Uh, Go ahead. Toby, let, let's just say to our students, one of the differences between working on a film and working in a newsroom is mm -hmm. that in a film you have days and weeks and hopefully you don't take months. In newsroom you have minutes and yeah. they, won't give you, they won't give you an hour and all of you should know how to deal with B-roll, which is what allows you to edit and to cut and to give a seamless presentation of what is a whole range of fragments. And this was done, uh, you know, uh, Toby did a, a, a wonderful job. And if you look behind Leo, he'll show you, uh, you'll see the tellies that they won and the way in which this has been received. Part of it also, um, and I wanna to touch on what Gail said, part of it also is the story itself is so morally elevating that uh, you knock on a door and you say to the person, this is a place where a little child was saved. And here's a, a man now who's what, four score years uh, and comes back to see where he was as a child. 
Um, it's an overwhelming experience. And I bet you that the medical student feels better about living in those walls ever since because goodness happened there. And wow, my place was the place that rescued a human life. Isn't that tremendous? Thank you. This film was produced from the beginning with goals and a mission in mind, creating a video that could serve as an education tool and also that could be out in our community. This is why we had focus groups throughout the production process with historians, community members, and students. Knowing that their students and their instructors would be viewing this at Stockton and beyond, as we know that this film has traveled and today this is a case of it on the road again, so to speak, we had a clear audience in mind. And I'd like to save some space to talk about how valuable knowing and understanding your audience is. This was really critical for this project, but we know this to be true really no matter what project you set out on. And I'd like to invite the panelists to share what are some considerations that we had in mind knowing who our audience was going to be. So I can I start, go I ahead with like you. I'd like to ask Dr. Birnbaum to comment on this because he's very modest, but I know that he's won Academy Awards and been in, and he's consistently on the History Channel. And I'd love to know what, um, what were you thinking as uh, you were helping us uh, to, with focus groups and getting the film ready? Okay, I was, I was muted, which is not something that ordinarily happens to me. Um, look, the first obligation we had was to tell the story. And then what we also had, which we really have, and I'm saying this both about the film and the exhibition, and we have to thank Leo for this, is we had the materiality with which to tell the story. We had a wonderful narrator in Leo but we were also able to reinforce the narration, make the narration become ever more vivid with the material that he had. And the assumption is that if you tell a good story, the audience will listen. And the other part of it, which I think that uh, we suddenly appreciate, is this is the story of a little child and all of us were once little children and consequently can um, identify with that. Uh, and the idea that we would be separated from our parents, raised in an atmosphere of love, it's not, it's not, you know, uh, uh, it's not a Cinderella story with a, a wicked stepmother or anything like that. Look at the love that, that these people expressed for him when, when their son could not take care of them. They had already had a, a real relationship with the child. They brought him into their home. He recalls his sister not saying what a pain in the neck it is to have a baby brother, but what to be loving and caring uh, for him. So um, we all can identify with that. And um, it's very, if you tell the story with integrity and authenticity, this powerful story, um, your most important task is to let the story shine through and don't let the film and filmmaking get in the way. And therefore you have to be a little bit modest in what you're doing and let the drama speak forth. And Toby did that. There are some questions from the chat that we are going to um, address. Someone asked, what are the takeaway lessons from the Holocaust? Are there any takeaway lessons from the Holocaust? Well, we don't have three hours, so we're not going to go into that. The, 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 let me give you the takeaway lesson the Holocaust. A great Holocaust scholar by the name of Yehuda Bauer 
was addressing the um, the German uh, Parliament, and uh, he said that his lessons of the Holocaust is thou shalt not be a perpetrator, thou shalt not be a victim, and above all, thou shalt not be a bystander. But with all due respect to Yehuda Bauer, one of the great scholars and, and probably one of the greatest teachers of this generation, who also was an Ida E. King distinguished professor at Stockton, there's one more thing I would like to add. Thou shalt be an upstander, meaning precisely what the rescue, getting involved, trying to help people, reaching out to people, standing up and embracing people and offering them compassion and a haven. That's what this exhibition represents. That's the magnificence of the story that's being told. And the lesson is, unless we are like that, the world can go in a very different direction. One more thing, which is that we now are looking for it in, in another way as well. Today, when we teach the Holocaust, we have to teach about the fragility of democracy and also about the fact that it is precious, but it also is precarious. We have to teach about the dangers of polarization, but I don't want to go on and on. Stockton, to its great credit, has made learning the Holocaust a part of the university's experience, and it's producing much better, not only students because of it, but much better people because of it. And that's part of the, the, the courage of Stockton. And I credit, in one sense, I, I credit uh, Vera Ferris uh, 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 King on that for, or Vera uh, King Ferris on that for her leadership. Now, now almost a generation ago, and we also have to credit Gail Rosenthal uh, for the extraordinary work that she does. I have a question for Leo. Did you ever, this is from Mackenzie, did you ever reunite with Tilly? Yes. Um, Tilly was uh, a great friend to her last days. Um, I used to go to Holland um, as a result of my law practice representing Dutch folks. Dutch businesses doing business in the U.S. I would go probably 10 times a year. I would always visit Tilly and I would visit um, whom you saw in the film, uh, my uh, war brother's uh, widow. Um, Tilly was terrific, um, but she didn't speak a word of English, maybe a couple of words that she learned from the TV. And I would go when my family was with me or members of my family, we would all visit Tilly. She smoked unbelievable quantities of cigarettes and her apartment smelled like hell, but she was terrific and uh, just a, a really neat person. I'm just very, very pleased that I was able to stay in the lives and vice versa of the people who rescued me and the subsequent generation. They have come to visit us in the US. Uh, we had a, a gathering at Stockton when this film was first shown and people from Holland came, uh, descendants of the Schimmels and Hochebones. Um, it was just very important to all of us that we stay in contact and we do, as recently as this morning, I sent to uh, the granddaughter of Pete Hochebaum, I sent pictures of my newest grandchildren. Um, so we have remained close and it's been just extremely rewarding to know that the story of these people who saved us still resonates within the descendants of those respective families. 
So speaking of descendants, um, Dirk is on the call from the Netherlands and he writes a very impressive film. I never heard my grandparents, Hogenbaum, talk about it. I er only heard some stories about the war from my mother and my uncle Pete. Only later I realized that my grandfather and uncle were in the resistance. So he uh, is, is here with us. Thank you so much for that. Um, and Dr. Morris writes also in the chat to him, to Dirk, that's very interesting. It suggests that they did not feel that what they did was extraordinary, that that choice was second nature. So this is a great exchange happening over in the chat and we thank you um, for that. And actually it's Dirk's wife, I'm sorry, who is there. Hi. But, but let's, let's add something to that. Part of the greatness of these people is the fact that they saw it not as an act of heroism, but as something they merely had to do. Um, I, I can tell you this from, from my work. When I first went to Denmark um, and interviewed rescuers, I kept thinking that they were extraordinary people. And they kept saying, we're not heroes, we're just ordinary people. And I learned through all of my experience in Holocaust studies to begin to listen to people carefully. And I, my first instinct was that they were so modest that they didn't even believe that they were extraordinary. And then I understood that they were telling me something about their moral character. And what they're telling me about their moral character was in face of evil, they precisely understood what they had to do. And it wasn't something they had to think about. It wasn't something they had to wrestle with. It wasn't antagonistic to their nature. It was a very integral part of who they were as human beings. And consequently, that's why they regard it as something ordinary. And that's what I did during the war. And in a climate in which we live, in which people brag about everything imaginable and boast all over the place, that modesty by people who have no reason to be modest or humble is a moral reminder of what decency is all about. There is um, some more in the chat. This is for from Summer. I think the story is incredibly moving to actually see the stories of the people who persevered through these horrific times. In addition, I find it amazing that there were individuals during this time who took in Jewish children who were unable to protect themselves during the Nazi occupation uh, throughout Europe. Okay, so we are, um, thank you for that, Summer. Uh, we are nearing the end of our time together. We are going to um, wrap up and I'd like to revisit um, everyone on the panel to have some closing uh, thoughts and remarks. My wish though is for those on the panel to also leave us with an action step. If you would be able to invite those who are all here today, if we were going to take one action step together after seeing this film, what could that be? So I will, um, I think I'll save Leo for last. I will turn to, um, to Dr. Birnbaum first, if that's okay. If I had to say um, what action we should do, uh, I would say there are many, many, many people in this world today who are in need. And I would say reach out to someone in need and help them with something very basic and very significant. Let it be an immigrant. Let it be an older person who is isolated and living alone. Let it be working in a food bank. Let it be um, even a, a little gesture as to say thank you and how much you appreciate the ordinary people who are putting themselves in danger to provide for our basic needs today. And every time you do that, remember that the grand act of rescue 
begins with ordinary human decency. And that begins with not him and not me, but you. Thank you. Gail, can we have an action step from you, please? You have to unmute. I'll leave with what I tell my students. One person can make a difference. And that really just supports what Dr. Birnbaum said. And if I may add, we have educators, I can see their faces, to say, please remember to include the story of rescue, how one person can make a difference when you teach about the Holocaust. Because from despair comes hope. And our hope for the future is using rescuers as role models for all of us. We're not all going to risk our lives, um, but we can make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Leo, can you leave us with an action step, please? My action step would be to value the time and opportunities that we all have in this country and very specifically to value the time and appreciate the time that you have with your family because it's so valuable and it can be taken away in a minute and uh, just appreciate what you have. Thank you so much. Okay, now I'm going to toss back to Professor Ludovich, who will close us out. Thank you all uh, on the panel, and thank you, Professor Ludovich, who will uh, say goodbye. All right, thank you. I think we can all agree um, this is a beautiful story of, of Leo's and a, and a beautiful team to bring us uh, his story. So I'd like to thank um, Toby, our communication studies spotlight speaker, Toby Rosenthal. Uh, thank you to our panelists, Dr. Birnbaum, Gail Rosenthal, Morgan Everman, Irvin Moreno Rodriguez, and Stockton's information technology uh, services team for uh, handling all of our technical needs uh, this evening. Um, and we are grateful for Leo Ullman for sharing his story, his time, and his wisdom with all of us today. So thank you and thank you everyone for joining us uh, this afternoon. We had a wonderful turnout and I'm, I'm really happy that um, everyone was engaging in the chat and um, you know engaged with us uh, for this event. So thank you very much.